ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय वेलकम टू टूडेज रीडिंग फ्रॉम ब्रिलियंट एज द सन रीटेलिंग ऑफ श्रीमद भागवतम वी गोइंग टू स्टार्ट कैंटो थ्री कैंटो थ्री इज बिन रिटर्न इन टू बुक्स वी गोइंग टू रीड द पार्ट वन स्टार्ट द पार्ट वन टूडे ऑफ कैंटो थ्री विदुर्स पिलग्रिमेज बाय कृष्णा धर्मा प्रभु एंड चिंतामणि धाम दासी माता जी we are going to start from the introduction first in canto 3 we again meet vidur who initially appeared in the first volume of this series the sages of namisharanya we learn that during his many years of exile from hastinapur he embarked on an extensive pilgrimage culminating in his meeting with krishna's cousin and confidant uddhav The conversation between them reveals intimate details about Krishna's family and pastimes as well as the tragic news of Krishna's departure from this world. On Uddhav's behest, Vidur meets the great sage Maitreya who was told by Krishna to teach Shrimad Bhagavatam to Vidur. Maitreya expands on our knowledge of creation, both primary enacted by Lord Vishnu and secondary enacted by lord brahma some chapters are quite technical so we extracted much of the intricate information into appendices for ease of recall and understanding as with the previous volumes in this series we also provide notes to aid further study and research the casual reader may find this volume difficult but for the serious student of shrimad bhagavatam it contains essential foundational knowledge which is indispensable for the aspiring bhakti yogi it is the intention of the authors to both remain true to the philosophy and teaching of the bhagavatam and also to provide the reader with an enjoyable read with this in mind we have taken the liberty to include dramatic scenes not found in the original text the most obvious of these are the prologue the epilogue and descriptive scenes inserted in various places such as the beginning of our chapters we do not claim to have had any divine revelation regarding these scenes although based around the often scant details given in the bhagavatam these scenes are imaginary intended to give the book a more visual dimension the prologue and epilogue are also to show the reader that the conversations between vidur uddhav and maitreya lie within other conversations the original dialogue is between suta and namisharanya sages represented by shonak this was introduced in the sages of namisharanya the second dialogue within the first takes place between parikshit and shukadev goswami This was introduced in the second volume of the series Mysteries of Creation. Just a quick recap of what we just read now. The conversations between Udh- Vidur, Uddhav and Maitre lie within other conversations. The original dialogue is between Sutta Goswami and Namisharanya sages. represented by shonak this was in the f- first book the sages of namisharan canto 1 the second dialogue within the first takes place between king parikshit and shukadev goswami this was introduced in the second volume of the series to canto 2 mysteries of creation I shouldn't have said Sutta Goswami and Namisha Namisharana sages. Instead, it should be only Sutta and the Namisharana sages, represented by Shonak. The Shrimad Bhagavatam is properly heard from liberated souls. Although we are not such, we are endeavouring to faithfully repeat their teachings. We have drawn primarily from the commentaries of His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta, 
Swami Prabhupada and secondarily from the commentaries of Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur, both of whom are highly reputed scholars and realized, self-realized souls. We hope after reading our book, you will feel encouraged to take up the study of original Srimad Bhagavatam with commentaries by Srila Prabhupada. So this was the introduction by Krishna Dharma Prabhu and Chintamani Dham Mataji. Now we begin the prologue. Just before sunrise beneath a vivid orange sky, the sages reassembled in the spacious corpse, corpse at Nemisharanya. This was their second day of hearing from Sutta after his return from his travels. The wobbling of countless birds filled the air and the sweet fragrance of tree blossoms carried on the cool breeze. As the sages waited for Sutta to join them, they praised their good fortune. Sutta's description of Krishna's universal form was astounding, said one. Indeed, replied another, I feel increasingly confident that simply hearing about Krishna can bring about the greatest good for anyone. Elsewhere, a few sages discussed the future. It beggars believe how much the people in this age will suffer. Do you remember what Sutta said? Persecuted by their governments, they will literally run to the hills, abandoning their families and homes. His friends nodded. One of them said, the earth will yield no grains of fruits. This will be, they will be mass starvation. Another added, most appalling will be their merciless slaughter of animals. Bereft of compassion, they will heartlessly abandon their wives, children and elders. The first sage sighed yet krishna is merciful see how he has sent sutta to us i feel certain that the lessons he heard shukadev narrate to king parikshit will protect anyone who heeds them even in the terrible times to come not only protect them said his companion but propel them to the greatest happiness i agree said the third sage after all parikshit was dear to krishna I am sure the Lord arranged for him to hear the best possible remedy to life's problem. The first sage added, It's astonishing how after hearing for only a few hours from Shukadev, the king became free from anxiety. I felt the same effect myself as I listened to Sutta's account of their conversation. His two companions both expressed how they Two had felt wonderfully peaceful, even elated. Discussing together in this way, the 88,000 sages gradually took their places at the holy pilgrimage site to hear Sutta speak further on Srimad Bhagavatam. Soon the elderly ascetic walked into the clearing towards them, accompanied by his dear friend Shonak. The audience rose respectfully to greet them. They ushered them to their places at the front, eager for Sutta to resume his narration. After they were all seated and had chanted melodic invocatory Sanskrit prayers, Shonak addressed Sutta, My dear friend, I have spoken to many of the esteemed sages present. They are all enlivened by yesterday's teachings regarding creation. We are eager to hear how now of Maitreya's conversation with Vidur and also description of the Padma Kalp. Sutta folded his hands in prayerful obeisance to his spiritual master Shukadev Goswami and began to speak. Picking up his narration by describing how Shukadev had recounted Maitreya and Vidur's meeting. So now begin, begins the first chapter of Canto 3 part 1 which is questions by Vidur. In this chapter we learn of the circumstances leading to Vidur leaving Hastinapur to go on pilgrimage and his meeting with, with Uddhav, Krishna's confidential servant uh, in Dwarka. A herd of elephants splashed in the nearby river. They trumpeted from time to time as they drank the clear waters, which sparkled in the rays of the rising moon. Parikshit sat perfectly upright with his feet resting upon his thighs, 
His throat was parched when earlier that day he heard he had been cursed to die within one week. He vowed to fast from food and drink until his death. Feeling the chill of the night air, he wrapped his thin shawl tightly around his upper body and leaned forward to listen more intently. His spiritual master, the youthful Shukadev, sat naked amongst the amid the many sages who had come to assist Parikshit during these seven days. As with the other ascetics, Shukadev had fully controlled his senses and was impervious to bodily disturbance. My dear Parikshit, I have answered many of your queries regarding creation. Those remaining I shall answer by citing a conversation between the great sage Maitreya and Saint Vidur. How did they meet? asked Parikshit, who had heard much about Vidur from his family elders. Your great grand uncle Vidur renounced his prosperous home just before the Kurukshetra war and he met Maitreya whilst on pilgrimage. How praiseworthy to give up his home to pursue spiritual life, said Parikshit. There was no need for him to leave home for that reason, replied Shukadev. His house was superior to all places of pilgrimage because Lord Krishna stayed there as if it were his own home. Parikshit remembered hearing that before the great battle of Kurukshetra, Krishna had come to Hastinapur to lobby for peace. Duryodhan invited Krishna to his opulent palace to rest and refresh himself before addressing the core of court. Krishna, however, declined, preferring to spend the night in Vidur's home. Vidur's chaste wife Sulabha was also a great devotee. Shukadev was right. There was no need for Vidur to leave either his wife or his home for spiritual advancement. Parikshit knew that the gentle Vidur had been upset by what had happened soon after Krishna's visit. However, his knowledge of those events was scanty. He asked, O oh Master, where and when did the meeting and discussion take place between Saint Vidur and His Grace Maitre Muni? Since Vidur was a great and pure devotee of Lord, his questions to Maitre must have been purposeful on the highest level and approved by learned circles. Smiling to hear the king's question which brought to his mind the events surrounding Vidur's departure, Shukadev replied, please hear attentively. Duryodhan stomped up and down his father's private chambers. Father, if you do not send the Pandavas to Varnavrat, Varnavat, I will die. I cannot live with them any longer. The king shook his head, my dear boy, how can I allow you to harm Pandu's son? His brother-in-law Shakuni sniggered. Who told you that this is our intention? My dear Dhritarashtra, we have never said such a thing. It seems your blindness may have affected your hearing. He brought his face close to Dhritarashtra's ears, ear and spoke softly. If you truly love your son and wish his long life, long and happiness, long life and happiness, you should agree to this small request. You need know nothing more. We shall arrange everything. Duryodhan assured his father that there was nothing to fear. After the Pandavas have been in Varnavat for, for some months, I shall be well established here and they can even return. What is the problem? The Drashtra swallowed heavily. There was surely something insidious afoot. Duryodhan despised his cousins who outshone him in every way and whose claim to the throne was foremost. The blind king wrung his hands. He wanted to see his own son on the throne rather than the Pandavas. But he felt ashamed of such thoughts. His younger brother Pandu had shown him so much love and respect. Although departed, he live, lived on in his five virtuous sons who treated their uncle Dhritarashtra with the same affection and reverence as had their father. Seeing this father's hesitance, his father's hesitancy, Duryodhan snorted, Uncle Shakuni, give me your sword. It seems the king loves his nephews more than his own son. I shall end my life, for I can no longer bear to live in their shadow. 
Dhritarashtra flailed his arms. No, my son, do not speak thus. No one is dearer to me than you. I shall do as I ask, but let us proceed cautiously. He tapped his forehead with his fingertips as he thought how best to proceed. Then a plan began to form within his mind. So that no one will suspect any foul play, I shall instruct my courtiers to describe the festival in Varnavat, in Varnavat all this week. This will arouse the brothers' interest. <clears throat> when they inquire about the festival, I shall suggest that they go there as my ambassadors. Duryodhan clasped his father's hand and kissed it. You won't regret this, father, I promise. The prince turned and left, followed by Shakuni. Once in his own quarters, Duryodhan summoned his trusted aide, Purochan. Taking him by his shoulders, Duryodhan looked into his eyes. I trust no one more than you, my dear friend. I am therefore giving you a most confidential mission. If you succeed, you will share this wide earth with me. Duryodhan ordered Purochan to go immediately to Varna Varnavat and have a mansion built for the Pandavas to occupy during their visit. Soak all the building materials in lacquer so the whole construction is highly flammable. When they are fast asleep and not suspecting anything, get the building alight. Set the building alight. It must look like an accident. Then when they are dead and gone, you and I shall rule Hastinapur together. Vidur's palace spies discovered the plot and informed their master. As the five Pandavas left for Varnavat, he warned them of the danger and soon after the departure, sent a miner to dig a tunnel under the house into the surrounding forest. And in due course of time, when the house was set ablaze, the Pandavas and their mother escaped through the tunnel. This is the famous Laksha Grehe. That is the mansion made of lacquer. After some time in hiding to Duryodhan's great dismay, they returned to Hastinapur to appease their, his son Dhritarashtra, divided the kingdom into two. He gave the prosperous half to Duryodhan and a vast desert named Khandav Prast to Yudhishthir. With the help of his brothers and Krishna, Yudhishthir transformed this wasteland into a thriving metropolis which rivaled Indra's celestial kingdom, Amravati. Duryodhan's heart burned with envy. He pleaded with his father to summon the brothers to Hastinapur for a rigged gambling match. So if Duryodhan is showing his... Uh, dissatisfaction even when uh, the Pandavas they somehow escaped and came back to Hastinapur and they were given the vast desert kind of breast to rule and they transformed that desert into something beautiful as beautiful as the kingdom of Indra Duryodhan's envy still had didn't stop there the blind king was initially reluctant, but his son insisted there is nothing to fear. Even if Yudhishthir suspects our motives, he will never disobey a request made by his elders. And believe me, he will lose. So he's, he's uh, plotting another, another of his schemes so that... Uh, he can ruin the Pandavas. Once again, the old king acquiesced and the match was arranged. Shakuni, a notorious gambling shark, played for Duryodhan using his enchanted dice. Yudhishthir lost all his wealth and kingdom. Not satisfied with that, Shakuni goaded him to try and win it all back. Yudhishthir bet his brothers one by one at a time and lost them all. Finally, he bet even himself and again lost. The smirking Duryodhan urged him to bet his beautiful wife, Draupadi. Duryodhan 
perspiring and breathing heavily. And breathing heavily. Yudhishthir sat with his mind in turmoil. He had lost everything, only Draupadi remained. How could he now do this duty to Krishna? He was a king meant to protect the people. How could he do that without wealth or a kingdom? Surely the Lord would help him. With his faith firmly in Krishna, Yudhishthir agreed to the final wager. To his horror, the dice went against him yet again. He was left with nothing, not even his own self. Duryodhan laughingly sent his brother Dushasan to bring Draupadi into the assembly and present her to her new masters. The evil-minded prince paid no heed to her tears or entreaties. Cruelly grabbing her hair, he dragged her into the gambling hall. Incited by his crony Karan, Duryodhan bellowed, Strip her. She is already a wanton woman with five husbands, so what does it matter if we see her naked? Dushasan seized hold of her sari and attempted to disrobe the bitterly weeping princess. Bound by truthfulness and depending fully on Krishna, the Pandas restrained themselves from immediately annihilating their gloating cousins. Vidur and the other elders repeatedly pleaded with Dhritarashtra to check his sons, but the king remained silent. Out of deference to him, no one intervened to defend the persecuted princess. Seeing that she had no protector, Draupadi helplessly fixed her mind on Krishna. O great Yadu Lord, protector of the people and soul of the universe, save me, who am afflicted with no other shelter than you. Krishna at once came there unseen and mystically provided her with an endless sari, thwarted in his strenuous efforts to strip her, the shasan collapsed in exhaustion. Jekylls began howling and the ground shook. The blind king sat shocked. What had he done? How had he allowed such heinous acts? These dark omens seemed to portend his imminent destruction. The same divine power that had miraculously saved Draupadi would surely wreak a terrible revenge on him and his sons. He raised a hand and stopped the proceedings. Fearing divine retribution, he released the Pandavas and their wives from slavery and returned their kingdom. However, the Pandavas travelled back to their capital, Duryodhan and his henchmen convinced the weak-minded Dhritarashtra that it had been folly to return the kingdom to the Pandavas. We must now fear, with, fear their vengeance. They beseeched him to send a rider to summon them back for one final gambling match. The terms would be that the losers would be banished for 13 years. For the final year, they would live incognito in a city if discovered they would have to go back into exile for another 13 years shakuni placed a hand on the king's shoulder with the pandavas out of the way we can consolidate our position and easily deal with them when they return the trashta finally acquiesced and a messenger left at once. I'll have to check the pronunciation of this word because uh, I haven't used it much. So I ask for forgiveness if my pronunciation is wrong. It is spent as A C Q U I E S C E D. Bound by an oath that he would never disobey his elders, Yudhishthir returned to Hastinapur on the Dhrashtra's request. Once again, he lost to Shakuni. Out of his strict adherence to truth, he honoured the terms of the match and retired to the forest with his brothers and Draupadi. For the thirteenth year, they assumed false identities and hid in the kingdom of Virat. 
Despite sending his spies all over the world, Duryodhan could not discover their whereabouts until the end of their exile. At that time, Yudhishthir sent a respectful message to his uncle Dhritarashtra, requesting for his kingdom to be returned and assuring the Kurus that he would not exact any retribution for the sufferings he and his family had endured at their hands. Dhritarashtra refused. For the last 13 years, his son Duryodhan had used the Pandavas' vast wealth to buy friendship and loyalty of many kings. The Pandavas had nothing. If there was a battle now, he was sure his sons would come out of come out triumphant. Krishna personally went to Hastinapur to sue for peace. So this is where Krishna goes as messenger to Hastinapur. for peace between the two sides of the family. To keep the peace, Yudhishthir will settle for five villages. After all, they are royalty and therefore must have some place to rule. So this is what Krishna said. Vidur and the other Kuru's elders urged Duryodhan to accept Krishna's offer and avoid a war. Duryodhan punched his hand with a loud slap. I will not give them enough land in which to insert a needle. He tried to arrest Krishna, thinking that the Pandavas would be powerless without him. To his amazement from the Lord's body, countless warriors, including even the Pandavas, emerged. Duryodhan's men fell back in terror. After Krishna had departed, Dhritarashtra sat fretting in his cham chambers. He could neither eat nor sleep. His son had committed a grievous error. Krishna was immensely powerful. Some said he was the Supreme Lord. The king summoned his brother Vidur. When Vidur arrived, the king was seated in his throne room surrounded by Duryodhan and his supporters. My foolish son has offended the powerful Yadohiro, he said. Yadohiro, as we know, is referring to Lord Krishna. He said, wringing his hands, Vidur, you are wise and my best well-wisher. Tell me, what should I do to avert calamity? Vidur sighed from the beginning of Duryodhan's aggression towards the Pandavas. He had constantly advised his elder brother to check his son. Each time his advice had fallen on deaf ears. He decided to try one last time to make the king see sense. You must now return the legitimate share to Yudhishthir who has no enemies and who has been forbearing the, through untold sufferings due to your offences. Dhritarashtra's face darkened. What are you saying, Vidur? Why should I do that? I have nothing to fear from Yudhishthir. He will never attack me. Vidur took a deep breath. Dear King, King Yudhishthir is not alone. He is waiting with his younger brothers, among whom is the vengeful Bhishma hissing like a snake. Surely you fear him. At the mention of Bhim, Dhritarashtra paled. Following the attempted disrobing of Draupadi, Bhim had vowed to drink Dushasan's blood, smash Duryodhan's thigh, which he had lewdly displayed to Draupadi after the gambling match and kill all 100 of Dhritarashtra's son, sons. If there was war, who could stop the mighty Bhim from executing these vows? Noticing that his father's fears of Bhim was weakening his resolve to keep the Pandavas' property, Duryodhan jumped to his feet. Father, you need not fear Bhim. I am more, far more skilled a warrior than him. I have been trained in mace fighting by none other than Krishna's elder brother, Balram. That hero has assured me that no one can match me in a mace fight. I shall surely defeat Bhim. So Bhim and uh, Duryodhan, they were both very good at the Gada Yudh. Gada, which is the mace. Ignoring Duryodhan's outburst, Vidur again urged Dhritarashtra to return the Pandavas kingdom to them. He reminded his brother that the Pandavas had Krishna as their ally. 
So Vidur is doing the needful by reminding them that Krishna is their ally. Krishna is on the side of the Pandavas. He is the supreme personality of Godhead and he has accepted Kunti's sons as his kinsmen. All the other kings of the world obey Krishna. His family, the Yadus, are unconquerable heroes and they will do whatever Krishna says. Dhritarashtra's mouth quivered. He had heard many sages refer to Krishna as the all-powerful supreme person. What if it were true? What chance did he and his sons have against the divinity? Maybe he should return the Pandav's kingdom, seeing his father's wavering. Duryodhan again leapt up. Krishna is just a sorcerer. I know, I also know sorcery. I'm not afraid of him. Vidur scowled at Duryodhan. Turning back to the king, he said, My brother, thinking of Duryodhan as your beloved son, you follow his advice, yet he is of his, his offense personified because he envies Krishna. So Vidur has, is telling so rightfully that because Duryodhan was offense personified. Since you are maintaining this atheistic non-believer, you will fall prey to misfortune. I urge you to abandon your Duryodhan and thus save yourself and our entire dynasty. Duryodhan exploded who asked him to come here, the son of a kept mistress. So he is referring to Vidur like this. He is so crooked that he spies in the interest of the enemy against those on whose support he depends. Toss him out of the palace immediately and leave him with only his breath. The palace guards hesitated, although a maidservant's son, Vidur was after all king's half-brother and chief minister. They looked toward the king, seeing that he did not object to Duryodhan's command They falteringly advanced towards Vidur. Vidur shook his head. He loved Duryodhan, who was after all his nephew, and he was unhappy to see him recklessly proceeding towards certain destruction, taking his father and the entire Kuru dynasty with him. Still, he took this as a godsend opportunity to leave for a holy pilgrimage where he could devote himself exclusively to Krishna's loving service. Placing his bow, sorry, his bow by the door to indicate that he would take no part in the ensured, ensuing war that was now certain, Vidur left his brother's palace. So Vidur, he left for the pilgrimage to serve Lord Krishna. Hearing of Duryodhan's offences, Parikshit breathed heavily and pressed his fist into his hand. Pray tell that the great Saint Vidur did after he left the place, the palace. Pray tell what the great Saint Vidur did after he left the palace. Shukadev replied, intent on increasing his piety and qualifying himself for Lord's transcendental loving service, he journeyed to holy places of pilgrimage. Listen as I recount his journey. Dressed as a wandering ascetic, Vidur travelled alone for many years. He passed through the forest and orchards, crossed mountains, lakes and rivers and visited scores of Vishnu temples. After seeing all the major holy sites such as Ayodhya, Mathura and Dwarka, seeking always saintly association, he reached Prabhas. Unrecognized by anyone, he lived simply depending on Krishna. In, Pra in Prabhas, he learned that Yudhishthira had become the undisputed emperor of the world. Hearing snippets of the conversations between the townspeople, he discovered that soon after his departure from Hastinapur, there had been a great war between Dhritarashtra's son, sons, the Kauravs and the Pandavs. Although not surprised, Vidur head fell and tears pricked his eyes when he received his this news so viduji was away when the battle of mahabharat was took place and he was still at his pilgrimage and he learned 
how Yudhishthir had become the undisputed emperor of the world afterwards. He continued westward through the region where the Saraswati flowed. He visited 11 of the most famous pilgrimages, pilgrimage sites along the banks of the Saraswati river where there were numerous temples. Walking for many years through the wealthy provinces of western India, he arrived at the bank of the Yamuna river late one night. There he saw Uddhav who almost exactly resembled Krishna. Vidur knew him to be Krishna's most trusted confidant in Dwarka and a disciple of Brihaspati, the god's preceptor. Calling out his name, he shed tears of joy and ran up to him. Uddhav sat leaning against the tree because of the darkness. Vidur did not realize that he had fainted in spiritual ecstasy, dropping to the ground next to him. Vidur embraced him firmly. Uddhav slowly opened his eyes, recognizing Vidur. He wept with joy and immediately bowed his head to Vidur's feet. Shrinking back in humility, Vidur spoke in a choked voice. My dear Uddhav, how fortunate I am to see you again. Pray give me news of Krishna and Balram. I know they are the original personalities of Godhead who appeared in this world at Brahma's request. Because of their advent, the whole world has become prosperous and happy. How is my good friend and brother-in-law Vasudev? He is such a generous man and always showed so much affection for his sister Kunti. One by one, Vidur asked after Krishna and Balram's family members. He mentioned Krishna's senior wife Rukmini and her eldest son Pradyumna. He also asked after the elderly Yadu king Ugrasen as well as Krishna's cousin Yuyudhana, one of Arjun's martial students. He inquired about Krishna's uncle Akrur who had brought Krishna and Balram to Mathura from Vrindavan. He also asked about Krishna's birth mother Devki. The learned Vidura inquired after Krishna's grandson Aniruddha, knowing that he was an expansion of the Supreme Lord. He also asked after Krishna's other brothers and sons. As he named each person, he described them affectionately. Having asked about Uddhav's family, the Yadus, he inquired about his own nephews. I hear that Yudhishthir is now the emperor. Is he ruling according to religious principles? Uddhav saw the sadness in Vidur's eyes as he went on. Duryodhan was envious of Yudhishthir's opulence, but that godly man was always protected by Krishna and Arjun's arms. Sorry, godly man was always protected by Krishna and Arjun's arms as if they were their own arms. Tell me, did Bhim wreak his revenge on the Dhritarashtra son who could withstand his might on the battlefield when he stepped out with unpraised mace? Tell me about Arjun who wields the celestial Gandhiv bow. That mighty hero once satisfied Lord Shiva in battle when the great god appeared before him as an unidentified hunter. Speak also about the twins Nakul and Sahadev. They were protected by their elder brothers as the eyes are protected by eyelids. Are all five brothers enjoying themselves now they have regained their rightful kingdom from Duryodhan? Vidur's voice softened. Does their mother Kunti still live? It was so hard for her after the great hero Pandu died. She would have gone with him to the next world, but she remained to look after their sons. Vidur hid his face in his hands and sighed, Gentle Uddhav, I simply lament for Dhritarashtra, who turned against our brother Pandu after his death. Misled by his nefarious sons, he drove me out of my house, even though I was his sincere well-wisher. After adopting such an immoral course, he cannot be faring well. Uddhav placed his hand on Vidur's arms, arm as Vidur continued, I am not astonished by Dhritarashtra's imprudent ambitions. 
during my travels i have noted that people who do not understand krishna are greedy and never satisfied i however have understood krishna's greatness my only desire is to render him loving devotional service thus i am happy in all respects although the lord comes to protect his devotees he refrained from killing the kurus when they antagonized the pandavas even when they insulted the chaste dopadi he did not strike them down some find this bewildering they asked why he tolerated such injustices in his presence but he did not excuse the kurus dear uddhav the lord was biding his time there were so many demonic kings disturbing the world krishna therefore brought them together at kurukshetra and slew them all in the great war so now we understand what was krishna's plan krishna got all the demonic kings together in in the kurukshetra battlefield and they were all vanquished at the battlefield together you know that one of the primary reasons for the lord's appears in this world is to annihilate the wicked he is not obliged to take birth like us he does not have a material body and is not under nature's law he comes out of his independent will to benefit his devotees and indeed all living beings when i explain this people challenge me unable to understand how he does good to all beings with or shook his head incredulously incredulously at such foolishness just by hearing of the glorious ways of ways krishna protects his devotees living beings are attracted to seek his shelter thereby achieving all happiness krishna's appearance benefits everyone even the demons he kills attain salvation so those who get killed by krishna which is supreme personality of godhead they also get the salvation how kind the lord is speaking about krishna had again raised with those spirits he reached out and clasped uddhav's hand my friend please describe krishna's glories for that is the best way to spend our time while stone pilgrimage while the universal gods are his surrendered servants whenever they face trouble in executing their service they seek his help it was in answer to their prayers that he appeared as a prince in the dynasty of his pure devotees the yadus tell me what he is doing now this has been a bit long reading but it was so beautiful so i decided to finish in one go we'll continue with a reading next time which is second chapter remembrance of lord krishna thank you for joining wish you all a very happy papmochni ekadashi if you're observing it hari om tat sat hari krishna